occasional hazard of folks who are involved in contact sports. And traditionally, um, this form of herpes infection is called her herpes latitorum after the Roman gladiators. This has been a hazard for folks that, that are wrestlers or involved in mixed martial arts where there's a lot of hard body contact, a lot of damage to the skin, you know, rah, 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 rah. and then if your opponent <laughs> is shedding herpes, um, and usually this is from ocular infections, then you can have massive infection over the uh, damaged parts of skin. And this poor guy, you know, here, this is scary, you guys. He has an infection in the eye. And again, if you have sufficient damage to the, to the cornea, this can cause blindness, right? So hopefully this is something that, like, the, um, the referees, right, would be checking to see if people have obvious herpes lesions and say, yeah, you can't wrestle with it. And here's the ocular, even a more severe case of the ocular ophthalmic herpes, so you've got to be careful there. Uh, finger, um, demonstrating the herpetic lid low. And um, we're going to be talking about chicken pox shingles virus, you guys, and I just want to let you know that, ch that chicken pox virus reactivation can look like this. So we'll talk about shingles, which is reactivation of the chicken pox virus. Um, shingles lesions can look like this as well. One of your colleagues a few, a few semesters ago, she had shingles and it looked just like this. The genital herpes, again, just these are these incredibly painful lesions. Fluid-filled lesions, want to remember these are chock full of virus. So primary infection of epithelial cells, invasion of sensory neurons, sacral, angry, they hang out and then they can come back down and um, cause these reactivations. Oh, right, right, this is key, you guys. So genital herpes, again, usually it's H, um, human herpes virus type 2, but this is just, you know, I just remember this. Um, this could also be caused by human herpes virus type 1. A huge concern, yeah, a huge concern is that if women become infected with genital herpes, one of the big concerns is if they become pregnant and they want to have a vaginal delivery, the concern is, is that as the baby is coming through the vaginal canal, the birth canal, and if mom is shedding, she's going through a reactivation, the baby can be showered with herpes virus. And the concern then could be that baby could develop oral lesions, ocular lesions, or the huge concern is the virus could actually spread systemic wide and invade the central nervous system. So it depends on probably the strain, it probably de depends on the immune status of mom, but in, in out of every, I mean, this is such a broad range, this just reflects different studies. Out of every 100 babies that become infected with herpes um, at birth or right after birth, so say neonatal newborn herpes, mortality rates depend on the report between 30 and 80 percent. And again, this is a reflection that the baby's immune system is so immature, the baby's immune system isn't going to be able to handle control of herpes replication. Now, part of this, uh, you know, what, uh, part of why, what might um, influence how badly the baby is infected may have to do with how long mom's been infected. So if mom's been infected with genital herpes for quite a while, she probably has pretty high titers of circulating um, antibodies against herpes virus. And one class of antibodies, IgG, can uh, cross from mom's bloodstream across the placenta into baby's bloodstream, <coughs> called transplacental transfer. And it's possible that some of the babies that do become infected, but the infection isn't that bad, it's possible that they have lots and lots of maternal antibodies circulating in their blood uh, that um, could potentially help the baby control the spread of the herpes virus. A huge concern, you guys, would be if you had a patient, say a mom, who's pregnant and she first becomes infected with genital herpes when she's pregnant. She might not have enough time to develop a lot of um, antibodies, might not have enough time to pass them through her baby. So if she was to have a normal vaginal delivery, I think, you know, and if she's reactivating, she's shedding herpes, I think that baby would be at much higher risk for really serious herpes infections. Now, your colleagues that have worked out in the real world, uh, before I used to say, so if mom has genital herpes, usually they'll advise a cesarean section. And your colleagues who work out there in the real world have said, that's not really necessarily true. 
Um, and what they shared with me is that mom can be placed on an antiviral medication. For example, one of your colleagues yesterday was just telling me, I wasn't sure if this was safe or not. They said, yes, it is. So let's say you have a pregnant mom, a pregnant mom, and she has genital herpes. So one of your colleagues yesterday said that in the hospital where she worked, one, one strategy is that they would put mom, mom goes on a cycle here, a cycle or another anti-herpes drug. Now, a cycle won't cure us of herpes, but what it can do is it can um, slow down viral replication, and that means we aren't going to be shedding as many viruses. Okay? So, um, in this particular case, a pregnant mom who had genital herpes, they put her on a cyclovir, an antiviral drug, and this may decrease the chance of a viral shedding, which would protect the baby. Okay. And your other colleagues have said that what physicians will do is they'll monitor their pregnant patients as they're coming to term. They'll monitor them with swabs to see if they're shedding. Um, but then another of your colleagues said that, I think she worked at Kaiser, and she said at, at the particular hospital she worked at, that the um, hospital had, like, I don't think they could force the mom, but they highly, 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 highly recommended that the mom had genital herpes, she have a cesarean section. And that would help greatly decrease the exposure of the baby to any um, herpes that were being shed in the genital tract. So I think the important take home message here is that um, for, for all of us, you know, for um, advising our patients, is just to make sure you're really in contact with the doctor and dis you know, um, discuss the different options for delivery. Um, some folks, they're just like, oh, no problem, I just want a C-section to make sure it's safe. But other people feel that a vaginal delivery, they, they prefer that. So it sounds like there are doctors that can't work with a genital herpes. Um, they'll work with the, the mom to see if a vaginal delivery might still be possible. Okay, so now tables, I know you guys, is a sure way to make you all fall asleep. But again, this is just to drive home this, this point of um, how the viruses don't read the textbooks. So here we're comparing human herpes virus type 1 and type 2. So the usual disease, so 90% of cold sores, there's oral infections with lower caused by H HB1. But again, what's so important, you guys, we want to remember um, HHV1 can also infect the genital tract. So 15% of genital herpes is caused by the type 1. And very important here, 30% of neonatal herpes are caused by type 1. Now, these type 1 infections might not be all caused by mom being infected with type 1 in the genital tract. This is really distressing to me. It turns out that, that we that have the oral herpes, like after the baby is born and the baby is still, you know, um, immune system isn't that strong. If I'm shedding type 1 virus and I'm kissing, you know, say my grandbaby, you know, I'm going to kiss that baby, I can be shedding the virus, right? Yeah. So it might be even after birth that adults can transfer um, um, herpes virus to the, to the baby just from oral shedding too. So that gets tricky, right? Because if you have grandma, granddad, uncles, aunts, they want to love that newborn baby, you know, and they, but they've got a little herpes lesion there, you might, I know it's a little delicate, but I say, ah, kiss their feet, here, you know, look at those little toes, kiss those little toes, try to keep away from kissing around the mouth and the face there. Okay, and likewise here with um, the HH, um, E2, the type 2, a majority of general cases, 85%, but again, you guys remember, uh, the type 2 virus can cause oral infections, and as we would predict, um, it causes the majority of the neonatal herpes cases you know, from genital shedding here. But again, I just want to stress you guys, those viruses do not leave the books. Now, we're going to move to another herpes virus, and this always you know, confuses me. We want to remember that this herpes virus, the chicken pox shingle virus, is, is not a pox virus family. It's a herpes virus. And officially, chicken pox shingles um, in the medical circles is referred to as varicella zoster. And I always think of varicella as the primary infection, the chicken pox infection, which in the old days before the vaccine we get as kids. And then reactivation is referred to as zoster or shingles. Okay. So here is a little uh, boy 
that's been infected with uh, varicella virus, and we see, it, again, it starts out usually as respiratory tract infection, the virus spreads, and then these are the, like the later signs, the skin, the skin lesions are the later signs. And in most kids, it's not that dangerous, um, but in some children, the virus can be very severe, can cause really high fevers. So in some children, it can be very dangerous infections. And that's why the vaccination, you know, I think is probably a good idea. One concern, you guys, if you have um, patients that have chicken pox, See how red and inflamed these areas are? Um, this, this child, any patient, would be at much higher risk for secondary staph aureus infections. So you'd really want to monitor closely, say, for MRSA infections. That would be really, really bad. But just as we saw with the um, type 1 and type 2 herpes viruses, the varicella virus, once it replicates in the epithelial cells, invades a sensory neuron, same story, can cause latent infections. So let's say we have skin lesions here, primary infection, invade the sensory neurons. They, uh, they uh, travel up the axon. Here is the neuron cell body in this ganglion. A ganglion, and you guys can yell at me, is a collection of neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so here's the nucleus of the neuron right here. And these little red dots are supposed to represent the latent um, herpes virus, the varicella virus. So again, with um, triggers, reactivation, and one of the classic reactivations is just old age. Your immune system starts to uh, decline in old age. The virus reactivates, travels back down, the sensory neuron reinvades the epithelial cells at the tips of the axons, and we end up with this um, reactivation that traditionally we call shingles or zoster. Very, very painful, I'm told. So this is an example of zoster. This is classic zoster or shingles. They, they talk about it often appearing as a broad band across the trunk. But we can see here it can happen anywhere. This poor woman, I'm guessing she, she must have some um, immunosuppression going on because it's everywhere. Um, a few semesters ago, as we mentioned, one of your colleagues after this lecture, she goes, you know, I have these vesicles on my finger. I was like, wow, it looks like shingles, looks like zoster, and sure enough it was. So again, you know, you can have lesions on your finger. My brother had it on his arm. Very, very painful. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm confused because when I was younger, because I, I got the chicken pox lady, and people used to say, like, well, as good as you got it when you were a kid, not when you were older. So okay. I think that might be um, another theme we often see with some of these. Um, illnesses that if you acquire the pathogen when you're young, your immune system doesn't respond as robustly, you don't get as many chemical messengers released, and you, you have milder disease. But when we get older, and our immune system has become really strong now, and we get some of these pathogens, the immune response can actually end up causing more damage sometimes than the actual pathogen. And I think chicken pox is an example. I think a lot of the childhood diseases like measles, mumps, a lot of those, um, in the old days before vaccines, some people would argue you want your kids to get them when they're little because they're less likely to become seriously ill. If you get it as an adult, often you're very, very sick. Yeah, and I think it has to do with the immune response. Yeah. So, yeah. This chicken pox in the sky is freaking me out. You can use this. <laughs> Of the Varivax, okay, an attenuated live varicella virus 
may not prevent chickenpox infections, but will reduce the severity of the infection called milder disease. So this isn't 100% protection, but the idea is it would decrease the number of cases of children that develop these really, really serious um, chickenpox infections. My best friend growing up, like in second grade, she got chickenpox, and she was out for two weeks. Um, they were thinking of taking her to the hospital. She had such a severe infection, and it caused severe scarring of her face. So that might be, you know, one idea here is if you just, if you aren't totally protecting your kids against chickenpox, at least you're going to decrease the chance of serious disease. Now, because these are attenuated live virus vaccines, whenever you're using a live pathogen, usually um, the, the dogma is that these vaccines usually give pretty good protection. But what I don't know you guys, and maybe you can help me out here, that, that is a huge concern. People say that if we start vaccinating our kids when they're young, will they have lifelong protection? And so I need to ask you guys that have kids, or maybe you guys that have been to the doctor more recently than I, those of you that were that were vaccinated, has the doctor asked you to get a booster? Does anybody know? Yeah, okay. My son, he, all my kids have the, the, uh, the actual chicken pack for my son, and I wanted him to have it. So yes. I took him to all the wrong people. Yeah, he this was a tradition. He never got, he never got it. But the doctor said he needs to have a shot. I said, but I didn't want him to you know he needs to have a shot. Okay. Go to school. Got so it. he had the shot, and then later on he had the he did get a booster. Okay, so that, because I know that was a huge debate when this first came out, when parents were making the choice. Do, do I let my kid get chickenpox, the normal infection, or do I get them vaccinated? And that was one of the things parents were worried about, was whether the vaccine would provide lifelong protection. So it sounds like, and I think this is smart, if you're worried about it, let's give them some boosters, right? So that, okay, that is good to know, you guys. So, Carletta, you might want to touch base with your physician and just say, should I be getting a booster vaccine, right? <laughs> you don't like shots like that, huh? No, okay. But it might be wise, right? If you if um, if you are concerned, you might want to think about getting a booster vaccine. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to do well on the metrics. So I just don't. <laughs> You're getting metrics, okay? Well, okay. Let's take your mind off that Met metrics exam. Okay. So now the zoster. Okay. Remember, zoster is a reactivation of the chicken box virus, um, the result of natural infection, right? So those of us, us old parts that that got chicken box when we were kids before the vaccine was developed, especially us old, old parts, because now our immune system is starting to fail, what we're worried about is what? We're worried about shingles, zoster, right? So they have also come out with a shingles vaccine, and one of them is called Zostavox. You don't have to remember these names, you guys, just Zostavox is a shingles vaccine for folks that did have chicken pox, and it too is an attenuated live virus. So we want to remember with these attenuated live viruses, folks, we always want to check the immune status of our patients, right? Because we don't want the vaccine virus to cause disease. And the second thing we need to remember is that if we are vaccinated, we must be careful not to expose people who may be immunocompromised, right? Because what are we doing after vaccination? The virus is replicating. We are shedding vaccine virus, right? So we need to be aware of those two safety concerns with these live uh, virus vaccines. Yeah. Uh, when shingles reactivates, are you still shedding the virus? Yo, thank you. That's so good. Okay. This, and this is really good. So, yes, in the lesions, you have infectious um, virus. But when you um, have shingles, your respiratory secretions are, are not infectious. If if a child develops chicken pox, they're shedding virus initially in respiratory secretions and shedding from the skin lesions. In shingles, since it's not in the lungs anymore, it's just um, in the sensory neurons in, in the skin lesions, it's only the skin lesions that are going to be, that would contain infectious virus. Yeah. So it's, you would argue it's less contagious. Shingles would be less contagious mm -hmm. than the initial chicken pox infection. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. And um, as far as I know, you guys, herpes, the varicella zoster, um, the herpes simplex virus, once we're latently infect infected, as far as I know, like blood is not um, 
blood is not infectious once we're latently infected, right? And that's going to be different with the next herpes virus we discussed. This is just a little kind of gee whiz. Um, physicians say that they can tell you which of your spinal nerves are infected with the varicella virus, depending on which area of your body uh, develops the shingles lesions. These are called dermatomes, the, um, the area of skin that's innervated by the different spinal nerves. It's just, just silliness, right? If you've got shingles, you're not interested in which spinal nerves are infected. Okay, this is important, and probably a lot of you know this already. Um, if you have children or teenagers and they develop a viral infection, you want to make sure not to give them aspirin because um, giving aspirin at the same time as viral infections in children and teenagers may increase their risk for Ray syndrome. And Ray syndrome, it causes acute encephalopathy, so central nervous system disorders, fatty infiltration of organs such as the liver, you see a rash, vomiting, confusion, coma seizures. It can, in the worst case scenario, lead to respiratory arrest and death. And what they've done in studies of Ray syndrome is trying to find out what are the risk factors? You know, why, why do kids and teenagers get this? Um, very often, the two risk factors are infection with a virus. It could be uh, DNA viruses like the varicella or Epstein-Barr virus. Both of these are herpes virus. They've all, also seen it associated with RNA viruses like influenza. And then it's the viral infections with um, use of aspirin that seems to increase the risk of kids and teenagers developing this. So what we did when our kids, well, until they, they um, were young adults, we just didn't use aspirin. We just got rid of it in the house just so we wouldn't use it as the, to reduce fevers, for example, just so there weren't any mistakes made. So again, you guys, the good news is we do have the childhood vaccines. We have um, vaccines for shingles. Uh, but we do want to remember that these are live virus vaccines, so caution who you're immunizing, and then folks that are immunized, you need to be aware that you could be shedding the virus, so be careful who you are around. Um, and again, the vaccines, of the, um, the childhood vaccine, it may not provide 100% protection against chickenpox infections, but should reduce the severity of the disease. And the same idea with the adult shingles vaccine, you might still get shingles, but hopefully it will be less severe and it will be a much shorter duration. Yeah. So, excuse me, if a child, um, a young child has the flu. Influenza? No. I think aspirin is not a good idea. My thought, and definitely want to touch base with your doctor, right? But my idea is probably with kids and teenagers, aspirin, I mean, just, you know, to err on the side of caution, maybe stay away from aspirin, but for fever, I think, um, Tylenol, acetaminophen, ibuprofen. Um, they, those have other risks, but I don't think they have the risk of Ray syndrome that aspirin does. But definitely, it's some talk, touch, touch base with your doctor and find out what's the best way to go to help, say, reduce fever in my children. Okay, but I think aspirin, you want to try to stay away from aspirin. Yeah. Okay, folks, um, what we'll do is, um, We'll just talk about this one last herpes virus. And um, this is the Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes virus type 4. And infections with this virus really is kind of a classic model of how infectious disease is not just the microbe, it's the host. And host immune responses, as we've been talking about, play an important role in how severe um, infection with a particular pathogen can be. So um, what we have down here is different levels of host uh, immunity, cellular immunity, the ability to uh, control viral infections. And we see four different examples of patients with different immune systems and their response to infection with the Epstein-Barr virus or herpes virus. So probably in the United States, close to 50% of us get infected with Epstein-Barr virus when we're kids. And because the immune response is not that great, a lot of, a lot of times as kids, we don't even know we were infected. So they're often asymptomatic infections. Um, but, just as we were saying earlier, if we don't get infected until we're older, say teenagers, early 20s, now our immune system is like, ah, we're going to nail those little viruses. And as a result of this really strong immune response, when our um, cells of the immune system are activated, they release chemical messengers, these, we'll call them cytokines. And these cytokines are often, uh, are what responsible for making us feel the sense of dis-ease, malaise, 
those cytokines can cause the achiness of our muscles, our bones. Um, and so often if we aren't infected until teenagehood or maybe early 20s, we will feel really sick. And this is the classic infectious mononucleosis, the so-called kissing disease. Now, in this particular herpes virus, it too can cause latent infections, but it doesn't invade the neurons. It invades white blood cells. It can be found in B lymphocytes and causes unusual, um, uh, un unusual forms. And it can also invade cells in the salivary gland. So it can be found in blood and in saliva, and hence kissing disease, so an exchange of saliva. Um, the saliva can act as a source of a virus. And it could be not only through kissing, but just use of, say, cosmetics like lipsticks, lip gloss, um, sharing uh, soda cans, using the same straw, any, any way that saliva is exchanged. So an infectious mononucleosis, often, you know, we, we feel really sick. And if you've had friends or maybe you've had the disease yourself, it often causes a sense of great fatigue. And again, probably all those cytokines. One more thing that uh, we just discovered uh, last year is that if, if the patient is involved in contact sports, it's usually advised that they stop playing sports until they're fully recovered. And I always thought that was because the doctors were, were afraid of transmission. But my understanding now is it's because if you have infectious mononucleosis, you're at much higher risk for splenic rupture. Your spleen could rupture. And probably it's because your spleen is working overtime, trying to remove all of the infected, damaged, abnormal cells. So that was how it was explained to me that you want people to avoid uh, any kind of uh, impact to the abdomen because it increases the risk of their spleens rupturing. It's not that they're worried that, that you're going to infect you know, your teammates or something like that. Okay, then what we do if we take a look at the kind of the opposite side of the view response. If we, if we look at the patients that have um, poor immune responses, they can't control viral replication, this is when we start seeing the increased risk for cancers. So with poor immune response, and this probably has to do um, poor immune response, it might be related to genetics, it might be related to nutrition, and it might be related to co-infections with other pathogens. Um, so in um, some parts of the world, co-infection with malaria, plasmodium, it, it apparently is a risk factor. Um, if you're co-infected with malaria and then are infected with Epstein-Barr virus, it may increase your risk for herpes lymphoma, which this poor, poor child is suffering from. And some parts of the world, I, I know my husband, who is Chinese, he's very concerned about nasopharyngeal cancer. His best friend growing up died from this. And again, it could be some genetic predispositions, maybe some strain differences in the Epstein-Barr virus, but Epstein-Barr virus is associated with increased risk for nasopharyngeal cancer. And a lot of folks have been interested in it as a possible cause for chronic fatigue syndrome. The star means it hasn't been proven, but there's interest in it. And then, in folks whose immune system is totally kaput, in folks, for example, HIV AIDS, um, Epstein-Barr virus, may increase the risk for cancers, such as this oral perioleukoplakia. Um, so again, it's uh, not proven, but folks think that Epstein-Barr virus infections may increase the risk. Okay, and then what we'll do, you guys, we'll close. We're not going to do cytomegalovirus. Um, on Thursday, we'll finish uh, with a discussion of hepatitis B virus, and then we'll do, uh, hopefully, only about a half an hour on prions. And then we'll start our combined chapter 14, chapter 15, how to look at Okay, are you guys here? Are you here?